climate change. Absolutely abandon your concern about um, a happy outcome. Uh, there is no happy outcome. This edition of Democratic Visions is about climate change. This is complicated, Jeff. Complex, you see. We'll hear from humorist John Spade in the guise of an academic who takes comfort in violent weather and rising sea levels. I, I, I almost would say that it would be positive if this happened. We begin, however, with an actual scientist. His name is Eric Grimsrud. Yeah, there's a deaf Mother Nature is driving this. She does things one way, her way, and, and that's what science tries to figure out, and that's what they're trying to warn the public about. Now, Eric Grimsrud has a calling. The retired professor is not happy with the politicians and the investment portfolio managers of this world. The guys who play golf with the coal and oil boys, the guys who profit from rejecting all that scary stuff about climate change and carbon emissions. I happen to think that the science is re really not very difficult, easy to understand, it's almost common sense, and that a denier is, is, can, can understand that just as well as anyone else. Uh, some people, ideology is, is basic to all their thinking, and then they stick to it. Eric Grimsrud is an analytical and atmospheric scientist. And bugs. Now, you might find him out on a Minnesota lake fishing for bass, but you won't spot him putting in time with a cribbage board at a local senior center. You will find Eric commenting on greenhouse gases in lecture halls to friends, on his blog, and when asked, next to highways. A carbon tax has another great advantage, and that is its simplicity. Eric also has a website and has written a really fine book on climate change. Thoughts of a scientist, citizen, and grandpa on climate change. The book brought Eric and his wife Kathy to Northfield, Minnesota. I think my old house was for sale recently. Yeah. They had met at St. Olaf College some time ago and were happy to revisit some familiar sites before joining a few college faculty to talk about the book. I strongly favor a carbon tax and dividend. You know, of the options that I'm aware of, but I, I'm, I'm not a professional economist. Eric has applied the curiosity, fact-checking, and vinegar of small-town newspapering to the science of climate change. In high school, like Brother Dave before him, Eric set type and operated presses in Zumbrota, Minnesota for their dad's newspaper. The News Record and Zumbro Shopper are still run by a Grimsrud. For 29 years, Eric Grimsrud taught atmospheric chemistry at Montana State University in Bozeman. These days, Eric and Kathy split their time between Spokane, Washington, and the Lake Country, north of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. For you folks in Minnesota, let me tell you what a few degrees will do. If the temperature goes down, say about 6 degrees centigrade, this fine lake here will be covered by about 5,000 foot of ice. So you're going to have a heck of a time drilling a hole for your ice fishing here at Deer Lake. And if the temperature goes up, on the other hand, to as it is now tending to be, uh, it'll go up, say if it goes up 10 degrees centigrade, then this here area will turn into a swamp. The entire world will be a water world and there will be alligators in Alaska. Now if you want to go ice fishing, then you're, you just ain't going to find a spot where really. you can do that. Unfortunately, some of the things that are being discussed today, or a lot of them, should have been discussed and acted upon 20 years ago. And unfortunately, we, we are now painted ourselves into such a corner that I'm afraid incremental little changes aren't going to do it anymore. And, and the science behind that is becoming increasingly clear. We need some major changes uh, uh, to the way we derive energy, use energy, and basically our lifestyles in the future. After decades of scientific measurement and peer reviews, warnings, and conferences, too many of the world's decision makers are, are, are sluggish. Now, I see in your testimony that your views have been evolving on this. Um, 
and I, uh, you note that man is responsible for some climate change. How if a, a senator from St. Louis Park, Minnesota gets it, why can't a former governor of Texas get it? Senator, it, far from me to be sitting before you today and, and claiming to be a, a climate scientist. Uh, I will not do that. I don't think you're ever going to be a climate scientist, and, but you're going to be head of the Department of Energy. That's correct. Uh, At Senate confirmation hearings in January and February, it became clear that the new administration would backpedal from renewable energy. You are going to be the head of the agency to protect the environment and your personal feelings about whether climate change is caused by human activity and carbon emissions is immaterial? Senator, I've acknowledged to you that the human activity impacts the climate. Impacts. Yes. Scientific community doesn't tell us it impacts. They say it is the cause of climate change. We have to transform our energy system. Do you believe we have to transform our energy system in order to protect the planet for future generations? I believe the EPA has a very important role at, at regulating the emissions You didn't answer my question. Do you believe we have to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel? The, the basic physics of it is very simple. The heat content of the entire planet is determined by only three things that we're all very familiar with. One would be the intensity of the sun at our position in the solar system, and another is called albedo. That term refers to the reflection, the amount of reflection of incoming sunlight off of the uh, Earth. And then the third one is the insulation uh, that the atmosphere provides around the Earth. Uh, as you know, just as in a house, adding insulation increases the temperature inside. So it's just those three things. It's the intensity of the sun, the amount of that sunlight that's reflected, and then the insulation around the, around the Earth. Those three things. The physics is very simple. Just like, that's just like if you were thinking about how how hot your car got when it's sitting in the sun. It would be determined by those same three things. Eric likes to refer to himself as a grandpa of climate change. These are some of his grandkids. He wants their future, the world's future, to remain free of fatal pollution. There's been lots of evidence of global warming throughout the world, and evidently it hasn't been enough to make a real a concerted uh, effort. To, to change the way we drive energy. We, we might need a smoking gun bigger than we already have had. Maybe a big chunk of Greenland falling off or Antarctica, which would raise sea levels up by, say, four feet uh, and thereby <laughs> cause some major flooding throughout the world. Maybe that would be the smoking gun that we're looking for. But unfortunately, by then it would probably be too late and there's a there's a momentum of climate change that, that keeps on going long after we quit. What mankind has done during the industrial age is he's learned how to, to uh, use, get energy from the combustion of fossil fuels. And in the process of doing that, you're converting carbon that has been, for millions of years, has been in the geological world into the biological world. When you burn fossil fuels, that carbon coal, gas, oil, whatever, turns to carbon dioxide. And then that carbon dioxide is picked up by plants and, and the oceans, and it's recycled between, in, within the biosphere. And so as a result, you're converting a lot of carbon in the geosphere into the biosphere, and that's the problem. We've added about 40% extra carbon to the atmosphere over the industrial age. So we have uh, now over 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. Uh, that added, adds, added insulation causes added heat. And the amount of heat is about equivalent to four atomic bombs of the Hiroshima type going off per second. Uh, that, that's a lot of energy that caused by that extra insulation. And so that is heating up the earth, there's no doubt about it. The, the, most of that heat goes into the oceans, so we, it's a little bit tricky to detect. Parts of it goes into the continents where it's easy to detect, and parts of it go into uh, you know, Antarctic ice and things like that. Mother Nature is driving this, and she does things one way, her way, and, and that's what science tries to figure out, and that's what they're trying to warn the public about.
NASA reports that globally, 2016 was the warmest year on record, the third record in a row. The conditions on the planet uh, have been developed and made essentially almost perfect for human beings for the last oh, 10,000 years since we came out of the last uh, ice age, a glacial ice age. That condition has been cha being changed by the increased temperature. And so it it's all it comes down to science how soon these things will happen. Eric appreciates the practical responses of folks who understand what we are up against. Good works, even at the family level, are infectious. Well, what about that roof up there? What's all that about? Well, those are solar panels that we recently installed on this home, our cabin here in northern Minnesota, and uh, it's producing a lot of electricity. The, the scientific explanation has to do with silicon atoms interacting with sunlight coming in. The electricity it produces ties right into our, the, the, the signal that comes in from the grid. And so that if in our house we aren't using all of that, it is put back onto the grid and uh, our meter then runs backwards. And of course at night and other times it's running forwards of course, so it ends up saving us quite a bit of money by running backwards much of the time. And in spite of being in fairly northern and cloudy areas, they, they work very well. There's no fossil fuel required to produce that electrical power I'm talking about. So it's a good way to go, and in the long term, it ends up being financially competitive with, you know, burning natural gas and, and so on. Wind turbines, hybrid and electric cars, conservation and, and bike riding are reducing the need for oil and coal. Now, Minnesota ranks about seventh in the nation for wind energy and is working to develop more efficient transmission grids by 2020. I guess my biggest frustration is that we, we all agree that Mother Nature is in charge and she does things her way, one way. There's not two ways, just one answer. And the field of discipline of mankind that has sought to understand what Mother Nature does is called science. And uh, but yet, uh, when and they've studied this problem and others for, for many years, when they come to conclusions, those, those conclusions and recommendations are not necessarily adopted by the public sector and their elected officials. That, that's what frustrates me. We have the mechanism for doing things. And in technology, we have a mechanisms for other means of energy production, and we, we simply aren't using them as much as we should. Je regarde euh, la salle, je vois que la réaction est positive, je n'entends pas d'objection. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. As of December 2016, 132 of 195 countries had ratified the UN Paris Accord. The historic agreement to begin mitigating greenhouse gas emissions in 2020. The United States and China, the two biggest producers of global warming emissions, were among them. A hail to the former chief and his administration. And today, the world has officially crossed the threshold for the Paris Agreement to take effect. Today, the world meets the moment. And if Even if Team Trump does not attempt to withdraw from or renegotiate the Paris Agreement, Grimsrud says it should have had more muscle. The, the Paris Accord provided some good news only in one sense, and that's the title. All the people in attendance, scientists and government officials, agreed that the, the all attempts would be made to keep future temperature increase to 2 degrees, if possible 1.5 degrees. But all that was was a, a statement of intent, and, and uh, it, there's no uh, beef to it. There's no, there's no discussion or decisions as to how that would be made. Now the model used in that is very troubling. It's assumed that we will use, we will produce too much more CO2 to hold uh, temperatures to two degrees by maybe mid-century, say 2050. At that point, we not only have to cut emissions, but we have to figure out how to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that's, uh, that's called a negative feedback technology. And the, the, the frightening thing about that is such things don't exist yet. That's just all talk, uh, theory. 
Amen Lake, a bit north of Grand Rapids, provides Eric dependable, if only temporary respite. The biggest concern I have about the future is that the temperature of the Earth rises to the point where natural positive feedbacks kick in. And positive feedbacks are not good news. An example of that is, is as the Earth warms, would methane and CO2 trapped in the permafrost of the North start to escape. And there's other compounds in the ocean beds, methane, called methane clathrates, which, which might very well release if the temperature of the Earth gets warm enough. And if that happens, it's, it's really kind of an end game. It, you end it, get into a runaway effect where those emissions cause increased temperature, which in turn cause more emissions, natural emissions, again, now I'm talking about, and until basically those materials are all used up. And, and that's, uh, that's troublesome. The world is now kind of, can be thought of as a, almost a literal powder keg. It's been cooling for 50 million years and the world is full of deposits which if released because of increased temperature would really exacerbate uh, the warming problem. So hopefully you know we, we keep the temperature of the earth down below the point at which those those events uh, begin to kick in. Well I believe strongly we should have had a carbon tax I believe it's long overdue, should have had one a long time ago, and that's why we have such a problem today. It's a fair, appropriate tax that would be uh, assessed be, before the, for the right to use the atmosphere as a, a waste dump. It's basically uh, stopping uh, what has been in, unacceptable in the past, using our atmosphere as a free of charge waste disposal dump for carbon dioxide. Kagama is, is much more well known near near uh, Grand Rapids, and there's some you know destination golf courses and all that stuff on it. And here. it would be a whole lot noisier. Yeah. Idea here would be the same as say in other forms of energy, like with nuclear energy. Uh, do you think you're paying for w nuclear waste disposal? Of course you are. You're not allowed to sprinkle it on your front lawn, you know, and you know, free of charge. And with uh, this issue of climate change, the, the seriousness, the gravity caused by CO2 in the atmosphere is just as great as, as the hazards associated with nuclear uh, waste. We, there's the mistake we made in the past. We painted ourselves into a corner. Our emissions of CO2 are still actually increasing. They aren't even decreasing worldwide. They're still increasing. Carbon tax is the thing that will kind of uh, take care of all the issues, or most issues are related to fossil fuel combustion, rather than having some energy czar sitting in Washington uh, cutting deals. Uh, this, this is just letting the free market uh, run its course in a fair way, charging the full cost of production of energy by all methods, including fossil fuel. By 2030, the Clean Power Plan will reduce carbon emissions by 32 percent below 2005 levels. Prominent elder Republican statesmen are now pushing for a carbon tax to replace the Obama administration's Clean Power Plan of regulations. And Minnesota lawmakers did consider but dropped an energy tax proposal in the mid-1990s but with the Energy Act of 2007, our state now ranks among the nation's leaders in reducing carbon emissions. Gas, coal, and deregulation, however, do remain in play at the state capitol, and so too the folks who see renewables as the sane energy option. Minnesota 350, Fresh Energy, the Sierra Club, and Honor the Earth are among the crusaders and the demonstrations are everywhere. Divestment of holdings in the fossil fuel industry is one of Minnesota 350's initiatives. In Minnesota, we're, we're asking folks to divest from the same list of companies that other people around the world 
are asking their decision makers to divest from, and that's the top 200 fossil fuel companies that have the most reserves in uh, coal, oil, and natural gas. Your Exxon Mobil's, Chevron, Shell. Divestment lands a, a nice rabbit punch to the carbon emission boys. It also feels good for the individuals, institutions, and pension funds to invest in the earth-friendly. For example, on February 23rd, the St. Paul City Council resolved to bar the city from investing in fossil fuel companies. And about 12 Minnesota colleges and universities have active pro-divestment campaigns. Well, to my surprise, I found great resistance uh, in divesting from fossil fuels by colleges, including the one that I went to in Northfield, Minnesota. And, and almost all of them, like Harvard, for example, one of the wealthiest private schools in the country, uh, it has resisted divestment from fossil fuel industries. And I find that very disappointing. The scientists at their own institution know what's going on and know that we can't uh, promote fossil fuel development, but yet the institutions that are run by um, boards of regents uh, don't, don't buy into that yet. I think the fossil fuel uh, corporations and style of life is so well integrated into all of life. It is just such a big change for everyone involved that, that they're not willing to be the leaders out front on it. They don't want to make people unhappy and, and, and cause people to uh, discontinue their own funding of, the, of their institutions and so on. It's a financial thing, I think, that we're all in, in up to our eyebrows on. In spite of divestment in action, St. Olaf, through XL Energy's voluntary wind source program, will soon power its entire 56-building campus with wind-generated electricity. Now, each year, this will avoid injecting 7,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions, which equates to taking 1,300 cars off the roads. What I try to do to everyone I talk to is have them understand some of the basic science involved. The science involved, the basic science is not very complicated. It's really amounts to a lot of common sense. That is the basic physics involved. That I think people, the general public, are entirely capable of understanding. And I happen to think that understanding why things are going on will help people understand uh, what is going on and how they can do something about it. Eric has more to say about divestment and carbon taxes at ericgrimsrud.org. That's ericgrimsrud.org. Eric and I were classmates at St. Olaf during the great folk singer scare of the 1960s. Uh, that's when scientists, philosophers, civil rights leaders, and Kurt Vonnegut were pop culture's real rock stars. Well, yes, and I, I, I will admit that uh, uh, reading all of my books might, for an American, be a slightly difficult read. Now here's humorous John Spade in the guise of one of his characters, the professor of negativity. I, I am starting a think tank for a negativity as soon as I get the funding, and of course the funding has been denied me uh, so far, and that's negative. Now, mm -hmm. a professor of negativity? Yes. You kind of float around from college to college here in the Twin Cities? I am an adjunct, uh, which is a very negative position, which I appreciate and enjoy. Yes. So you don't have tenure anywhere? No tenure, just floating and um, always worried, but uh, still negative. You get McAllister at all, the University of Minnesota, St. Olaf? I have, I have spoken in all these places to small crowds because Americans don't, uh, as yet, appreciate negativity as they should. Well, the world has a lot of very serious problems going on. Of course, oh yes. Foremost in my mind, really depressing one, is climate change. Climate change, wonderful driver of negativity. Right, well yes. scientists are predicting now that a number of coastal cities mm. around the country are going to be flooded out 
and yes. it's not it's going to happen fairly soon much more sooner than we thought people will have to migrate away yes. from places like uh, Manhattan New Orleans uh, the delta in Louisiana the delta in Egypt Holland most of Denmark Houston much of Los Angeles yes Venice it's going to be history uh, really depressing yes and, and extremely hopeful for the growth of worldwide negativity well i, I but do you see any hope or any cheer on this bad news? Or? Uh, Jeff, you, you have to understand, to, to ask me if I see cheer is, uh, is, 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 is it's like asking um, a, a, a French person if he would like to eat American bread, okay? Um, no, I, I, uh, I, I feel that the rush to high ground, the desperate attempt to escape uh, the, the fate that awaits us all, which is, after all, death, um, is, uh, well, it, it's a powerful motor of negativity, the negativity that I promote, and uh, attempt to convert Americans into loving and embracing, okay? So when you're leading your lectures, your yes. seminars, yes. and you get these three or four people who show up for them, right. you're telling them from your point of view and your philosophical premise Absolutely. that climate change is good, that flooding out of our coast, coastal cities is going to make... Um, you know, you more comfortable, I guess. Absolutely. You say every human being, Jeff, is walking tightrope between darkness and blackness. Mm? Yeah. Eventually, yeah. we're going to pitch down into absolute, infinite, total negativity. We don't know when, we don't know where. We prepare for it, and the closer we get to it, the more mm, exciting it becomes. The closer we approach it, the more realistic everything is. The closer we approach, the more our culture gets enriched by the nearness of negativity. So when you're lecturing to uh, some students at St. Thomas, yes. you're going to say, don't worry, things are going to get worse. Absolutely, y yes. Uh, absolutely abandon your concern about um, a happy outcome. Uh, there is no happy outcome. And let's just dance with that truth, okay? Have you ever seen movies from uh, Eastern Europe? Uh, all the uniformly negative, all bleak etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also very rich uh, with human drama. Uh, uh, if America wants to improve its culture, it's going to have to uh, get a little more Eastern European, I think, Jeff, and therefore a little more negative. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Well, yeah. could we move on to another subject? Well, sure, sure, of course. Now, the Star Tribune. Yes. There's a lot of negativity in the reader comments service. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.